Ah, we're now live. Welcome, everybody. Um, Sarah Binnabinor, this is our third episode of uh, our series, our six part series on Jewish languages. And I'm just going to pass it right to you. No need for too much introduction today. Um, today is Becoming From. Let's do it. Let's do it. Hello, everybody, and welcome back. We are talking about Becoming From, how newcomers learn the language and culture of Orthodox Judaism. And I'm Sarah Bunin Benor, professor at Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion and director of the HUC Jewish Language Project. And I'd like to thank Lex and Dan from Jewish Live for inviting me to do this series. This is the third in a six part series. You might have heard of Eliza Doolittle from Pygmalion and My Fair Lady, and you might have heard of medical students, and you might have heard of new parents. Now, what do all of these people have in common, and what in the world does this have to do with becoming from? Well, these are all people who are taking on new roles and identities, and language plays a big role in the transitions that, they're make, that they make. So for example, Eliza Doolittle has to learn how to speak like an upper class lady. And medical students have to learn the technical jargon of their chosen specialty. And new parents have to learn how to talk about their baby and to their baby. And this is also the case with people who become Orthodox. When people join an Orthodox community, they have a lot to learn in terms of observance and in terms of culture. And we're gonna focus on the culture, especially the language. Two terms that you should know as we're talking about this important topic. One is balei tshuva, or bal tshuva is the singular. It means a returnee, somebody who returns, someone who does teshuva, which means repentance. And uh, the term that is often used in the community for balei tshuva is BTs. In contrast to BTs is the term FFBs, those who are from, from birth or religious from birth. And this could be people who grew up in a community that is all FFBs or people who grew up in a community that also includes some BTs as well. My research question that I started when I was in graduate school was how do BTs learn Orthodox language and culture? I answered this question using ethnographic and sociolinguistic fieldwork, meaning I hung out with people and I listened to how they speak and I recorded their language and analyzed it. I did this research in an Orthodox community in Philadelphia from 2001 to two. There were two main field sites, the, uh, an Orthodox outreach center, which I am calling Ner Tamid. These are all fake names because I wanna maintain the privacy of the institutions and individual individuals. And Milldale, an Orthodox neighborhood that was about a 45 minute drive from the outreach center. The people who worked at the outreach center were um, residents of Milldale, but the outreach center was in an area which was mostly non-Orthodox Jew, non-Orthodox people who lived there, including a lot of young Jews. Now there's a continuum of religiosity from secular to Haredi, or Haredi also means um, ultra-Orthodox or black hat as it's sometimes referred to in the community. Reform, conservative, and modern Orthodox Jews are all along this continuum. And then uh, I am located somewhere between reform and conservative, I would say. And then on the right end of the continuum, we have yeshivish and Hasidish. Now, within a yeshivish, there is a distinction between yeshivish modern and yeshivish black hat. And the community where I did my research would, be ident would identify itself probably as yeshivish modern. Now I wanna give you a little bit of background about Orthodox Jews. Orthodoxy entails adherence to Jewish law, some degree of social separation, although never complete social separation, cultural practices, including distinctive dress. The dress is sometimes 
in, is based on the principles of modesty. And also there are certain conventions within Orthodox communities that have developed over the years. The community where I did my research, which means Eastern European Jewish, is heavily influenced by Ashkenazi Eastern European cuisine. Uh, and home decor is also quite distinct. Bookshelves tend to line a lot of the rooms, bookshelves with a lot of Hebrew and Aramaic books, and large tables to accommodate meals with many people. And uh, often they are covered with white tablecloths with plastic coverings. And there is distinctive music within Orthodox communities. They tend to avoid listening to secular music. And right now I'm focusing not on the modern Orthodox community, but on the yeshivish communities. There are distinctive names within Orthodox communities, a lot of names from Hebrew and Yiddish, and often double names. And finally, language, which is our focus today. Now, the community where I did my research is mostly native English speakers. They are descended from Yiddish speakers, but they themselves mostly cannot speak Yiddish. They tend to be proficient in Hebrew for prayer and study. And the men in the community also tend to study Aramaic rabbinic texts. But when they speak English, it is distinct from general American English. The main way that it's distinct is through the use of loan words. A loan word is a word from one language that's used within another language. And in this case, they're using loan words from Hebrew, Aramaic, and Yiddish. They're also using Ashkenazi pronunciations of Hebrew words and forms of Hebrew words. I'll give you some examples in a few minutes. Um, they also sometimes have distinctive pronunciation of English sounds, like saying going instead of going, or beard instead of beard, or right with a long t, t at the end instead of right. And there are also grammatical influences from Yiddish, like staying by them, or this is not what to hear, or um, intonation. If you've heard it, you know what I'm talking about. There's that chanting intonation. But then there's also um, less, less intense remnants of that. Like, if you're going to the store, get me some milk. And there are other features like the click, which is an influence from modern Hebrew. So let me show how, how these features play out in some quotes. This is a quote from a rabbi. The mitzvah of the matzah by the Seder should be, we're machmir, it's a chumrah to have shmura mishasa ktsira, that the wheat that is harvested for Pesach should be already watched from the time of the harvest. So here you see that T release, that the wheat that is harvested for Pesach, right? You see the by from Yiddish, which is influenced by that same word in Yiddish, by, is used in different ways than English by. And many Hebrew words, mitzvah, matzah, machmir, but you see how the words are pronounced in Ashkenazi Hebrew ways, like shmura mishas ha instead of mishaat ha ketzira, right? Um, so it's not the Israeli Hebrew, it's the Ashkenazi Hebrew pronunciation. Here's, all, here's a quote from a woman in the Orthodox community, an FFB woman. In another community, people might, if they have a different sort of Yiddishkeit, so they might not daven in the same shul. They might send their kids to different yeshivas. So you see that click and that so. Of course, so is an English word, but the way it's used there is influenced, I think, by Israeli Hebrew, az. Uh, and you see a number of Hebrew and Yiddish words here. Now, people in the Orthodox community are aware of their distinctive language, and they have a name for it. They call it frumspeak or yeshivish. And there's actually a dictionary of this language uh, by Chaim Weiser. It's called frumspeak, the first dictionary of yeshivish. Highly recommended. It's not just a dictionary of the words used in the community, but also some interesting analysis of the language. 
And there is a song about this language called Yeshiva Shared. There is definitely an awareness of this distinctive language, and there is an awareness that it tends to be associated with men, that men tend to speak in the most distinctive way, but that women also have distinctive features in their language. Okay, now that we've talked about these distinctive cultural practices of Orthodox Jews, we get to our research question. To what extent do BTs adopt these cultural practices? Well, in my research, I found two different strategies for negotiating their Orthodox identity as they enter a new community. And they're doing these strategies as they are taking on certain locations along that continuum of orthodoxy. So they might want to position themselves as modern orthodox or as Haredi, yeshivish modern, yeshivish black hat, Hasidic, right? So they will figure out a location within that continuum based on the community where they have been interacting with people and based on how they understand their own observance. So within that continuum, I, I noticed two different strategies, hyper accommodation and deliberate distinctiveness. Let me explain. Hyper accommodation is a term from social psychology and sociolinguistics. In, in trying to adopt a new way of speaking individuals go beyond the norm. That is, they try to sound like a certain type of person, but they do it even more than that person that they're trying to sound like. And we see this in many cultural domains. We see that BTs take on orthodox cultural practices to an even greater extent than FFBs. For example, when I told an FFB girl about my research, she said, Oh, you mean they learn it and then they make they go way beyond other people making us feel like we're not religious. And there are many jokes about this. Every culture has its uh, light bulb jokes, right? So there's a light bulb joke about Bali Chuva. How many Bali Chuva does it take to screw in a light bulb? You mean you can do that? This plays on the idea that Orthodox Jews have all these restrictions and BTs are concerned that they'll make a mistake in their observance of them. So they will sometimes go beyond what is necessary in their observance. Another joke about this is the couple that moved into a new apartment and they spent all day unpacking boxes and setting up and then the woman accidentally uses a fleshic spoon for ice cream, meaning a spoon that is meant for meat products, and she used it for a dairy product. And then the man noticed this and says, ah, oh, that's it, we're moving again. And this also applies in language as well. Names. Uh, so when um, names have, when, when words have, when Orthodox Jews say the name of God, they often avoid saying the Hebrew word ale. Instead, they will say kale. And so the joke is, what do BTs name their children? Kelly Sheva and Kelly Kaku. <laughs> the idea that they wouldn't want to use the name of God, even when it's in a name that normally has that name pronounced in its normal way. And another joke is, what do BTs drink? Ginger kale instead of ginger ale. And I do recommend making uh, ginger kale. It's a nice stir fry. You put in the kale and the ginger and the onions, and it's delicious. OK, so another example of this hyper accommodation is a BT, not the one pictured here, who told me, I had days when I was not sneeze. So for me, I feel like the way to do chuva on that is I'm going to double cover. And what she meant by that was that she was going to wear both a shaitel, a wig, and a hat, meaning she was going to double cover her hair to try to make up for lost time. And because it was a way of making up for what, the, the, what she thinks are the bad things she did in her past. And an FFB says, in their attempt to make sure that they're saying things properly, BTs end up making more of a botch of it. 
There are people who try too hard. Every other word is some kind of Hebrew or Yiddish expression. And the one that a lot of people point to here is the word mamish. The Hebrew word mamash, pronounced in Yiddish or Ashkenazi Hebrew as mamish, is an intensifier. And so you could say, ah, I was mamish tired. Or, you know, you use it in the way that you would use really. And apparently BTs use this even more than FFBs. A BT, an FFB woman said, sometimes a BT wants to sound from. So they throw in from expressions. BTs do it more because they're trying to make up for lost time and because they're trying to fit in. That's a mark of being from. They don't want to be looked down upon. They pepper their language with Baruch Hashem more. I use them too, but not every third word. Baruch Hashem means bless God, and it is used often in Orthodox communities as a response to how are you? How are you? Baruch Hashem, bless God. Now, an example of hyper accommodation is Rebecca. When I met her, her name was Rebecca, although not actually Rebecca, but a name similar to that because we're using pseudonyms, just a reminder. So her name was Rebecca, and then she changed it to Rivka. And then she changed it again to Rivka Bracha because of the common convention within Orthodox communities for Orthodox Jews to have double names. And this is not a first name and a middle name, it's just a double name. So Rivka Bracha used so many features of Orthodox Jewish English. She used many, many Hebrew and Yiddish words. She used clicks. She released her T's a lot. She used distinctive intonation. She used Yiddish grammatical influences. Once she said, this is not what to record. She was telling me a story. So, but luckily I had the tape recorder on when she said that. So I got that on tape and then I turned it off. Uh, so she used all these distinctive features and she was very proud when an FFB woman cast her as the Yiddish Bubby from Borough Park in the women's Purim spiel. She felt like this was a mark that she had made it, that she was able to pass as FFB, even though she was proud of her BT identity and she didn't hide that fact, but the fact that she was cast as an FFB in this Purim spiel made her very happy. She said, I don't speak the good King's English anymore. I speak this English yeshivish stuff, which is fine by me. So that's hyper accommodation. Now let's move on to the next strategy for integration into Orthodox communities, which is deliberate distinctiveness. This entails being distinct intentionally. Sometimes when BTs make mistakes in language, they don't mean to, but often people use interesting combination as combinations as a way of highlighting their distinct identity as BTs. So for example, you'll get unique combinations like a black hat with trendy sunglasses or the woman who made her gefilte fish with curry and turmeric. And uh, I was a guest at this home and someone said, ooh, this gefilte fish is delicious, what's in it? She said, curry and turmeric. And I was surprised because I had never heard those words in the Orthodox community before, because at that time, international cuisine was not very common. I think since then, things have changed and international cuisine has made inroads into Orthodox communities beyond the modern Orthodox. And I think that BTs actually played a role in that transition. Another example is musicians who um, were into hip hop music before or reggae, and they continue to perform that style of music even after they become from. And you can see here Mati Siahu, who is now no longer from, but at this point he was, and you can see that even in his most from stage where he has the long beard and the black kippa and the black suit, um, you can see he's, you know, positioning himself in a position that wouldn't be so common in Orthodox communities and even has his shirt untucked in a way that you wouldn't see it. Although his tzitzis, his um, ritual fringes are, are visible. So it's a really interesting combination that I would see as deliberate distinctiveness. Or maintaining hobbies that are not that common among Orthodox Jews, like this woman who is snowboarding in her long skirt or maintaining pets. 
Now, pets are very interesting because in Orthodox communities, pets are not very common. There is a very strong fear of dogs and just pets in general are not common. It's hard to take care of them while maintaining Shabbos observance. And there is just sort of a taboo against pets, especially dogs, but a lot of BTs are very attached to their pets or having pets in general. And so they have pets, but often they'll give them Hebrew or Yiddish names. And stay tuned for that in, the, in uh, one of the future lectures, I'll be talking about the Jewish names of pets. So you also get interesting combinations of looking from, but also maintaining piercings. Um, or some people take out the piercings, but some people keep them in because they want to highlight their distinctiveness, their, the fact that they are BTs. Jacob is an example of someone who does this deliberate distinctiveness. He uses Hebrew and Yiddish loan words. He uses many Yiddish grammatical influences, even final devoicing, which is not that common among BTs, like saying going instead of going. But he also uses some mild profanity and slang, like, oh, he really screwed up there, something like that, which you wouldn't hear so much among FFBs. And Jacob is aware of that. But for him, it's important to maintain parts of who he was before he became from. Now, sometimes this deliberate distinctiveness is based on concerns with authenticity, this sense that it's not authentic for them to speak in a way that sounds like they're FFBs. For example, jo Joseph said, people who say Torah as opposed to Torah are either Balei Tshuva who are really trying hard to look really yeshivish or FFBs who have a Hasidish or very religious upbringing. And so he didn't say Torah, even though he could and he had friends who did, but for him, it didn't feel authentic. And this relates to the, the dress as well. Some people will say, oh yeah, when I wear the black hat, it feels like I'm putting on a costume. And it feels the same way with the language. Samuel is also a good example of deliberate distinctiveness. He actually avoided most of the distinctive orthodox linguistic features. He didn't use any distinctive grammar, clicks, or distinctive intonation. He did use some Hebrew words, but with some mistakes. So he would say things like bal tshuvas instead of bal tshuvas or bale tshuva. And he was aware of this. He, he was fine with it. He said he was actually, um, he actually felt that my research focus on language was misguided. He thought that I shouldn't be focusing on language because that's not what's important for bale tshuva. What's important is how you behave and your beliefs, not your cultural practices like this. Now, sometimes I observed these orthodox cultural practices in um, order. And then it was a progression that I called the bungee effect. Now, I've never done this, but apparently when you do bungee jumping, you jump off of a high place and then you bounce up at the bottom and you end up in the middle, right? And this is what people do when they hyper accommodate and then they do deliberate distinctiveness. They start by jumping off the deep end and doing more cultural practices than would be expected of an FFB even. And then after a while, they bounce back to a happy medium. So we see this in Levi's transition. He says, initially, you're constantly trying to prove yourself. And then eventually you get to a point where, you know, I'm comfortable with my knowledge and what I know how to do, and I'm not fooling anybody but myself. And you come to grips with who you are. There's a lot of sort of going out and finding where you feel comfortable. So you really have to go beyond it and then slip back to it. So that's the difficult part of the transition. And we saw this in his dress. In the time that I was doing my research, I noticed he was wearing dark suits and black hats every day. And then by the time, uh, you know, a few months into my research, he had transitioned to wearing um, the black suit only on Shabbos and on other days he would wear less formal clothing. 
Now, all of these things that I've been talking about are beautifully demonstrated in a song by Rabbi Moshe Shur. This song is called BT Blues. And as you listen to this song, I want you to pay attention to the linguistic features of the song, but also to the content and how he's describing hyper accommodation and deliberate distinctiveness in progression of the bungee effect. Now this is a story about a man named Joe. Okay, that it stopped. Hold on one second. Did some chuva, or at least he thought so. But after 15 years, eight whole months, and just about a week, they still call him about chuva freak. Oh Lord, don't make me into a Benoni. All my friends are tzaddikim. It's so hard on me, cause I work on myself. But I'm still a bit confused. Yes, I got me a case of them Bauchuba Blues. Joe went off to a simple and took a glance. They were all dancing the lush and hora, and it didn't have a chance. There were a hundred percent authentic super glot FFBs, a different kind of breed than a real IPT. Oh Lord, don't make me into a bane o knee. All my friends are tzaddikim. It's so hard on me, cause I work on myself, and I'm still a bit confused. Guess I got me a case of them. Bauchuba Blues, Joe went down to shul to learn how to dobbin. He shuckled so hard, his head was a bobbin. They all stared at him, not knowing what to say. You're much too quiet for us. You're not talking or making a fuss. You just can't do what you wanna. You got way too much Kavana. Joe went out on the shit. On the balas chuvas freakus, even ironed his titsis. He knew he had a weakness, but when he saw her standing there, her chumash and Birkenstocks, he knew she was a zibug, another one of the flock. Oh Lord, don't make me into a Benoni. All my friends are tzaddikim. It's so hard on me, cause I work on myself. But I'm still a bit confused. Guess I got me a case of them. About you, the blues. Now Joe has a family, a mortgage, and a car. He's come a long way, though he hasn't gone too far. But when his kids show him the pictures of them good old days, he says, it really doesn't look like me. It must be my old friend's fee. I, I could have never, ever looked like that. I'm not wearing my Stetson hat. Now they call our Joe Yussel from a bits. He even talks during Dabnit and hangs out at the Schwitz. He trimmed his beard to pay us and only learns once a week. He's become one of them, a real Hebra man. He's now an FFT from, from Chuvia you see. About his past he will not speak, cause he never lets on that he ever once was a Bauchuba freak. Lord, don't make me into a Benoni. All my friends are tzaddikim. It's so hard on me, cause I work on myself. But I'm still a bit confused. Guess I got me a case of them. Bob Chuba Blues. All right. Thank you, Rabbi Moshe Shur, for writing a song that so beautifully represents what I've been talking about here. You saw in all of those underlined sections, all of the distinctive things that, that the BTs go through, that deliberate distinctiveness and the hyper accommodation. And you also saw all of the Hebrew and Yiddish words that, that were used in these Orthodox communities. 
So now I want to turn to the how. We've talked about the what, what are BTs doing, but how do they actually learn Orthodox language? This last part of the lecture won't take too long. We will have time for questions. So to answer that how they learn question, I turn to the language socialization research paradigm, which investigates how children and adult novices are socialized into language and through language to become competent group members. That means that they're learning language. It could be they're learning their first language or it could be that they're learning a um, jargon of a particular profession. So they're learning language, but also through language, they're learning to become competent members of this group. Novices learn new practices through legitimate peripheral participation with veterans and other novices. That means that they are peripherally, peripherally part of these communities. They're participating, but kind of on the periphery. And then eventually they gradually work their way into more central parts of the community. And their participation is legitimate. It is um, understood by people who are veterans that these novices are supposed to participate and eventually learn to be central members. So in our case, the novices are the BTs and the veterans are FFBs, but also well-integrated BTs. The novices also learn from their interactions with other novices. BTs gain increased access to roles and responsibilities within the community. So for example, sometimes um, the outreach center where I did my research would assign a very newcomer, someone who had only been to one or two classes to sign people in. And that was a brilliant move because it really made them feel more invested, but it also gave them access to the way that the community worked they got to learn people's names as they checked them in. They got to hear their language, their greetings, shalom aleichem, aleichem shalom, right? Um, and then sometimes they would invite newcomers to bake challah with the Rebetzin, the rabbi's wife. And this was also another good opportunity for them to get exposed to cultural practices within the community, in this case, in people's homes rather than in the outreach center. So as they got exposed to these new linguistic features, they also had opportunities to try them out. They would sometimes avoid them thinking, oh, this is not how I'm supposed to be talking. But the longer they had this peripheral participation, the more likely they were to start trying out these linguistic features. And I'm gonna show you how this language socialization process worked by giving you examples from the weekly study sessions of Andrew and Avram. Andrew is a, was a recent BT. Now, by now, he's probably a veteran BT. Uh, and Avram is um, a community veteran, somebody who grew up Orthodox, an FFB. <coughs> so here I'm going to explain how they uh, talked about the words mekel and machmir. Mekil means lenient and machmir means stringent. And the word machmir in particular was pretty common in this Orthodox community. So Avram said, mekil and machmir, you know what I mean? I'm sure you've heard those terms before, like, oh, he's mekil. Yeah, yeah, sure, I just never knew what it meant. Exactly, because no one, machmir I knew, but yeah, but they always say that and you never know what it means. And you're always too embarrassed to ask and you're always expected like you know, you know, it's kind of rough. So Avram was expressing sympathy for the learning process that he knows that Andrew is going through. And you saw that there was that explicit language instruction that Avram was explicitly teaching these words because he knows that's important for someone who's integrating into the Orthodox community. We also saw him teaching the word schwer. Now, remember, this was a study session where they were learning Gemara. They were learning the Aramaic text, which includes a lot of Hebrew words and Aramaic words, but not Yiddish words. So the words that they were discussing sometimes appeared in the text, but this one did not. This one is the word schwer, which is Yiddish for difficult. They encounter a difficult passage, and Avram says, as they say in the yeshiva, it's schwer, it's 
difficult. It's hard for me. Andrew laughs because the way he said it was kind of funny. And Avram says, no, I'm serious. I hear that all the time. So Andrew says schwer and writes it down. So notice he's trying it out. He's saying it and he's writing it down because he feels it's important for him to learn this distinctive language. Then in the text, Andrew encounters the word pshita, which means simple. And he had recently learned that word. And he says pshita. And then he looks at his notes and says, it's not shaver. And Avram says, it's not schwer. It's not schwer. Good call. You know how to use that word. You see how well you're using these words? I want you to use schwer whenever you speak to anyone now. You're just walking on the street. And Andrew smiles and says, that's going to be very schwer to do. So you see how he's trying them out. And in, in the case of um, this line here, he actually made a mistake. He said shaver because he wrote it down probably in Hebrew letters and didn't write down exactly how it's pronounced. And then he uses it here in a marked way, in a way where he's saying that's going to be very schwer to do. He didn't just say that's going to be very schwer to do. He actually raised his voice and his eyebrows when he said schwer. So based on interactions like these, many interactions like these, I came up with a set of stages in loanword acquisition. The novice, and they don't have to go through all of these stages. Most people don't go through all of them for every single word. They hear about the word without noticing or without understanding it. And then the novice hears it in a context that facilitates understanding or remembering it, then asks about it or looks it up and then perhaps uses it with a mistake or in a marked way. And then the last stage is using it seriously, correctly, and with full authority. I'm gonna show you how these stages played out over the course of four months when Andrew was socialized to use the word chazer. Now, this is not the word chazer like pig. This is the word chazer meaning to repeat or summarize part of a text. <clears throat> so stage one, hearing the word without noticing or understanding it. Av Andrew hears Avram use the word chazer a few times, but he doesn't make any indication that he notices or understands it. And you see the dates here. This was November 26th. That same day, Avram explains the word by telling a story about his chavrusa, who thought that learning Gemara and not chazering it is like planting a field and not cultivating it. That's a context that might help Andrew understand it. A week later, December 3rd, we see stages three and four. As Andrew is about to chazer the text, he says, now what's, the, what's this called when we uh, sort of summarize what we did? It's ka, and Avram tells him chazer. So he's asking about it, right? And then he's using it with a mistake, that ka instead of the chazer. Next stage, that same day, uh, when Avram asks Andrew to go through what they just learned, Andrew says, you want me to chazer it, huh? And so he paused, he had a rise in his tone, and he was smiling. This is using it in a marked way. That's December 3rd. And then by February, I noticed him using it still in a marked way. Want to chazer? Let's chazer, right? He could have just said, sure but he wanted to use that word. So it's still kind of marked that he, it's still kind of new to him, right? And then a month later, I noticed Andrew using chazer regularly without a smile or other marking. So in conclusion, as novices gain increased access to the sociolinguistic repertoire of orthodoxy, they are actively engaged in learning to make it their own or avoiding elements of it. Community veterans and other novices help them in this process through interactions of language socialization. BTs make creative use of the orthodox cultural repertoire to negotiate their new identities, to present themselves not only as, BT, as orthodox, but also as BTs. And we see how this plays out in the communities that I mentioned at the beginning. 
medical students, sometimes when they learn the jargon of their profession, will use it even more than veteran doctors. Uh, for example, uh, one doctor that I know, my husband, I remember when he was in med school, he started using myocardial infarction, meaning heart attack. I think that's what it means. Uh, and But he would use it not just in communication with his fellow doctors or medical students, but also with people like me. And so I would say that's an example of hyper accommodation where you're using jargon in contexts that veterans might not use it in. And new parents, uh, when I became a new parent, I did some deliberate distinctiveness. I didn't really feel comfortable talking to my baby like, oh, you're so cute, what a cutie. I, I eventually picked that up, but, but initially I didn't feel comfortable with that. And so I would kind of talk to the baby like she was an adult. And so that was my form of deliberate distinctiveness. Or I would feel uncomfortable saying things like, I'm putting the baby down now. So I might say it in a marked way, I'm putting the baby down now. Uh, and then of course, Eliza Doolittle has a lot of these uh, features as well. When she's trying to learn how to say the rain in Spain stays mainly on the plain, she keeps saying the rhine in spine stays mainly on the plain. And then um, when, uh, so you see her learning how to do this. She practices over and over and she finally gets it. That process of language socialization where she is learning from a community veteran how to sound like an upper class lady. But she has some hyper accommodation where she uh, is trying to learn how to say the H sound. And so she is supposed to say in Hartford, Hereford and Hampshire, hurricanes hardly ever happen. And instead she says in Hartford, Hereford and Hampshire, hurricanes hardly ever happen. And uh, so that heva is where she is hyper accommodating. She's using that H in a place where it isn't supposed to go. And of course, you see newly Orthodox Jews doing all the things that I've been talking about. And you can read more about that in my book, Becoming From. Thank you very much. Let's turn now to questions. So Lex, if you're still here and available, I it would am. be great if you could um, choose out some questions for me to address. Sounds perfect. And uh, just so I'm not a mysterious voice, I will turn on my video as well. Great. Okay, hey everybody. Um, we've got a number of great questions and I'm gonna start in the Q&A area. There were a few in the chat also. Um, one right towards the beginning when you first introduced the idea of a BT, of a Balteshuva, somebody asked what I thought was a really fascinating question, which is, what is the analogous experience of people becoming reform Jews? Yeah, um, well, it's very similar and quite different. It's similar in that when people convert to Judaism um, or when they are Jewish from birth but haven't been involved in a reform community and then get involved in a reform community, there is a lot to learn um, a lot of Hebrew words that are used within the community and um, distinctive patterns of discourse, but much less distinct than Orthodox communities. So I would say that there's a little bit of a learning process that has to happen, but not nearly as much as newly Orthodox Jews. But it is enough of a process that one reform rabbi actually had a class where the people in the class were learning not Hebrew, not Yiddish, but Jewish English. They were learning how to speak like a reform community member. Cool. Um, so uh, follow, a follow up, which is sort of related. This is out of order because I think it ties into what you just said. So um, curiously, this person doesn't see hyper Hyper accommodation. Thank you. This um, Peter doesn't see hyper accommodation quite as much in the other direction, referring to folks leaving orthodoxy for the secular world. Um, they do try to fit in, um, but in Peter's view, always or frequently keep the sing song pronunciation, some other features. Um, do you think that that's accurate? Do you think that that the hyper accommodation and the distinctiveness, uh, the deliberate distinctiveness might be more the entering from 
side or is it manifest in the other direction too? Yeah, it's a great question. Well, I, I hope that someone will do research on the language of formerly Orthodox Jews. There have been some great studies of how um, people change when they become unorthodox. Uh, but it, there hasn't been that much research specifically about their language. And I would say that as they become unfrom, they sometimes try not to sound from, but they can't avoid it. And that has to do with the critical age of language acquisition. If people learn a language before they're seven to 13, that's the critical age when your mind is, is forming. And after that, it's very, very hard to learn a language in a native sounding way. And so the same is the case for, um, for people who, are, who grow up in a Yiddish speaking community or in a community of yeshivish speaking Jews, right? That when they become, when they're no longer from, they have a lot of trouble hiding their language patterns, even if they want to. So I do think there is hyper accommodation. In fact, you have stories of people becoming unorthodox, people becoming secular, but really taking it to an extreme, eating pork all the time or bacon cheeseburgers um, or, um, really wearing very promiscuous clothing. Um, but then you also have stories of people who do interesting combinations, like they'll keep their payas, or some, some women will continue to wear skirts or feel uncomfortable going in wearing a bathing suit in public. Um, and so I, I do think that these, these factors apply, the hyper accommodation and the deliberate distinctiveness do apply to formerly Orthodox Jews. But I think the, um, sometimes the distinctiveness is not as deliberate as you might think because of that critical age of language acquisition. Great. Um, so one, one piece that was just a quick practical one, and I'm gonna ask two at once just because the first one's quick. Um, there was somebody asking to clarify what you said about the final T. Um, she wasn't sure. She said she felt like at one point you said that it was extra emphasized, and at other points you mentioned that it was dropped. And she just was curious if you could clarify that. And, oh right. Oh, so yeah. Um, right. So in American English in general, many people release their T's. You can say right, or you can say right. But but. In uh, Orthodox communities, there is a tendency to, to release the T even more than in the general American population, and also to release it even longer, that the burst of air afterwards is longer, and sometimes it even sounds like an S, so it can sound like right or right, rather than just right. And also there's a gender difference here that men tend to release their T's more than women in Orthodox communities. I have an interesting paper that analyzes that in a Chabad community. That is really funky. Um, that's re I never, never occurred to me. Cool. Um, so there's a couple related questions that um, I'm going to blur together just because, you know, we, we want to respect time. Um, but there's, there's a couple questions about code shifting. Um, one of them uses the phrase code shifting specifically, and another is just about the differences between um, what you might speak among uh, your community in a yeshiva um, within the community and what you would speak outside of it. So I'm just curious if you can comment a little bit about what code shifting is and how it manifests for ultra orthodox. Yeah. So style shifting or code shifting or code switching means to speak differently in different contexts. It can also just mean mixing language, mixing codes, right? Um, but I'm assuming that's what the, the, the people asking the questions are referring to is, is the situational code switching where, they'll, where they will speak differently in different topic conversations and with different people. And the different people is a huge thing in the Orthodox communities. Um, there is a tendency to use the insider language only with insiders. And when there are people who are not insiders present, they will be less likely to use that language. And you see a great example of this in um, a video series that was created to um, teach about Lashon Hara, which means evil speech or gossip. And it's, it's about um, how you're not supposed to speak Lashon Hara. But the, there are two videos that are exactly the same content, 
but completely different language, one geared toward insiders and one geared toward newcomers or outsiders. And you see, when I analyzed these videos, I found that they used all of the distinctive features of orthodoxy in the insider one and in the newcomer one, they used some, but they tended to translate the words that they used. And they also avoided some of the linguistic features that they knew were um, not so common outside of orthodox communities. So yeah, there's definitely a lot of style shifting. Um, and people who, and Bale Chuva do this as well, but one interesting aspect of hyper accommodation is that sometimes they hyper accommodate, I mean, sometimes they style shift less than an FFB mic. So for example, I found that a woman who was um, um, a newly Orthodox Jew, she, she said Baruch Hashem to a man who was most likely not Jewish, a homeless man who was begging for money and she gave him a dollar and he said, thank you, God bless you. And she said, Baruch Hashem. And I thought that was so interesting because uh, I noticed an FFB would not have done that. They would have just said, bless God as well, they, because they know that this person wouldn't understand Baruch Hashem. Or another example, um, I took a woman to get her wedding dress altered and at the tailor who wasn't Jewish, she said, oh, can you um, just fold it under instead of cutting it? Because I need to make sure it's okay for another color, uh, another bride. So you see there, she, that wasn't intentional. She didn't, I think it wasn't, I, she didn't mean to use that Hebrew word, kala, bride, um, but she um, is so used to having, she replaced the word bride with kala in her language so that even when she's talking to someone who's not Jewish, she is using that Hebrew word. So the, the, the concept of style shifting mm -hmm. is, um, plays out a little bit differently among balei tshuva. Cool. Yeah. Um, I'm actually, I've, I grabbed myself. I'm going to pass a little baton right now to Dan, who is oh, in great. the chat. Okay. Um, can you, um, I actually yeah. can't do this because I'm my host. Can you make Dan a panelist? Yeah. Um, sometimes you have to actually press it twice because Zoom is finicky. But okay. um, Dan, should, ah, there's I Dan. Did. Dan is going to take over duties because I'm headed to another event, the Quarantine Book Club, also on Jewish Live. If y'all okay. want a double header, then you should head to that. Um, I'll see y'all next After week. After this is over. Thanks, Lex. Okay. Yeah. Hi everybody. All right. Hi Dan. I'm, I'm here to uh, uh, review questions. Um, so, uh, so I sorry, I'm a little. Uh, I wasn't sure. I wasn't able to see the questions when I was over there, so I'm not so really sure where. Oh, okay. Well, so I so I can see some of them, so I'll okay. I'll start looking. Um, so Jane says the refrain of that song, "Oh Lord, please don't make me into a Benoni," is so taken from Janis Joplin's "Oh Lord, please give me a Mercedes Benz," right? Um, yes, absolutely. And um, also the concept of um, um, I'm a Baal Tshuva freak, that is probably related to being a Jesus freak, the idea of, you know, um, embracing Christianity later in life, right? Um, yeah, and the song is fascinating. Someone else also asked about Moshe Shur uh, using Nashville intonations, right? Um, yeah, that's a really a good point. It, it, the song, most Orthodox music doesn't sound like bluegrass, right? <laughs> this is a very distinctive sounding song that is heavily influenced by um, musical styles not normally found in the Orthodox community, which is another example of deliberate distinctiveness. It turns out, Sarah, that I can't see any of the questions. You can't see the that, questions oh, from before okay. I came in, so you should keep going. Oh, got it. Okay, okay. So I, I do have access to them. Let me see. Um, how can the word chazer have such different meanings? Well, the, the the word for pig comes from the word chazir, and the word for to review comes from lachzor to re, to um, return. Right. Um, so it's just. It, there, you know, Hebrew has a lot of words like this that have some of the same roots, but have very different understanding. Uh, what does in a marked way mean? It means um, highlighting that it is not usual for them, that they mark it as being um, not their own by saying it in a different tone or by highlighting with their language that they are saying something that's not their own. Like, oh, as FFBs say, Torah, like that kind of thing. 
Let's see. Someone says, is the acquisition of loan words any different from acquiring new vocabulary in one's first language or in second language acquisition? Um, that's a great question. A little bit, it, it is different in that um, you're, you're, not, you're not trying to acquire a whole separate language because the syntax and the sounds and the structure are, are English, but you just have to learn how to acquire a few words and insert them here and there into the conversation. So that in, in that sense, it's, it's a little bit different. Um, okay. I think, oh, some, no, uh, last time we didn't realize there were questions in the Q&A section in addition to the chat. So this time I'm going to make sure to address those. Yeah. Uh, let's and there's see. a new one in the chat that says, uh, did you see this one speak that uh, there was a song once set to the gambler, but the lyrics were about laying to fill in. I don't know if you're aware of that song. Oh, no, I'm not familiar with that song. Um, yeah, I don't know. It could be by Country Yossi and the Stiebelhoppers. He's a <laughs> performer who does a lot of uh, parodies like that. Uh, so somebody asks, how did you choose this dissertation topic? Well, um, I went to grad school to study linguistics because of my undergrad experience where I was studying uh, linguistics and I realized that there was this thing called Jewish languages. And then I realized there was this Jewish language emerging around me, Jewish English, and I wanted to study that more. So when I was in grad school, I did a little bit of <coughs> research at a Chabad school. And there I encountered Balei Tshuva. And I realized, oh, wow, this is a really interesting thing, not just to describe the language that they're speaking, but the process of learning. So that's how I came uh, onto this topic. And then I um, did my research in, although I went to Stanford for grad school, I did my research in Philadelphia. And there were several Orthodox communities in Philadelphia. So I was able to find a community that had a lot of Balei Tshuva. And I found it a really interesting and enriching topic that was useful not only for understanding Jewish language, but also for understanding the process of adult language socialization more generally. Uh, somebody asked, uh, last week I discussed Yiddish, Yeshivish, um, oh, Ying, okay, right. So she was asking, or he is an anon anonymous person. Um, what um, the what were the two different types of Yiddish influenced English? It was Yinglish and Yeshivish. So Yinglish of the immigrant generation and Yeshivish of um, Orthodox Jews. And now I think we are out of time. And uh, I would just want to um, plug my uh, my coming talks. One is. Uh, next week, I'm going to be speaking with my colleagues Jonathan Krasner and Sharon Avni about our forthcoming book, Hebrew Infusion, Language and Community at American Jewish Summer Camps. And then after that, we'll have two different sessions on Jewish names, family names and personal names, including names of pets. So please uh, be sure to join us for those. And um, thank you to Jewish Live and thank you to Lex and Dan for stepping in as moderator. I really appreciate that and um, look forward to seeing you at other Jewish Live events. Yes, we look forward to seeing you. And I want to give a plug for that one on the Jewish names because I saw in, in your in your description of it that one of the pet names was Golda Meow, which I thought was fantastic. <laughs> and it's a, it's a great plug for the series. We will have to invite Golda Meow to attend. She'll love it. All right. Well, thank you so much, Sarah, and thanks everyone for being here, and we will see you here next week. Thank you.